this because I've got to do this. Sorry. Um, so I'm really happy to, we had a little chat prior to this, uh, but I wanted to introduce uh, an old colleague and a person I greatly respect in this business, Martin Kirzenbaum. Um, and since I speak German, I actually know what that means. Um, speak to Deutsch, yeah? Ein bisschen? Nein. Not really. Not, Not really. very much. Not very much. You speak Spanish, though. Hablo español, eso sí. Yeah, I remember that. Um, so I just wanted to have Martin come on because I think uh, we were talking a little bit about just how our industry always changes and it's in fluid, and obviously we're in a big state of that. So we're just going to have kind of a conversation. Um, and definitely, if you guys have questions, uh, just, you know, obviously t turn your cell phones off, uh, put your pants on. Um, as I always say, pants are required. Um, and, um, you know, just uh, raise your hand in the, the function and we will uh, get your questions in. So don't worry about interrupting or doing anything like that. It's fine. So, um, so Martin, how are you today? Where are Very you? Good. Thank you for having me. I am at Cherry Tree Headquarters in Los Angeles. Okay. And um, I guess I just wanted to start, I always like to ask, because I think everybody's uh, story on how you got here, at least the initial things, what, what kind of got you into music? What in general? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to be part of your class, Beth. I think, I'm, you know, the, the feeling's mutual about uh, my respect for you and also, um, you know, you were in the trenches with me on many developing artists. And um, I always remember, uh, because there are very few people like this, people that are ready to roll up their sleeves and help um, no matter what. And you were always that and you, you still are that way. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for inviting me to your class. Also, I want to commend everybody on, on being so good at remote learning. Everybody seems to be like punctual and on time and the faces look really uh, curious and interested. And that's, that's impressive. Um, how did I get into music? It kind of got me. Um, I was uh, just very young and I, I, I just started gravitating towards music. You know, first the records my mom and dad would play. Um, had an interesting um, time growing up because I lived in different continents. My parents are research scientists and uh, they're from South America. So we lived there. Uh, actually, I was born in California because my parents were, were doing a study in, um, in San Diego. So I was born there and my dad had a green card and I, I was born and then we moved when I was uh, almost two back to Buenos Aires in Argentina, which is my, my first language is Spanish. And then I grew up there and then um, my parents would go to different laboratories, do research, publish the results and then, and then move. Um, and we ended up living in different places in Europe and then on the East Coast, we lived, my dad got a job at Yale for a couple of years, I lived in New Haven. Um, my accent changed, you know, in English and um, ended up at uh, Michigan State University, my dad. And so I did a lot of my formative time, you know, high school and college in Michigan. Um, and during that time, I was always, the constant was music, my sister and music. And my sister, coincidentally, is also a musician. She's a violin player, she plays an orchestra, went to Eastman School of Music. So that was kind of our our constant, if you will, our thread through all the moves and everything uh, with each other and, and just the soundtrack in general. Mm -hmm. um, I also got a chance to listen to music from all over the world, not only because my parents would play music from their upbringing and from, from all over Latin America, but also because we were moving. So I don't know, at one point, um, I got enrolled for piano lessons. I was probably around eight and, uh, and my whole world just changed. You know, First it was technique and then it was music theory and then it was music composition. And I ended up studying that all the way through college at University of Michigan and I just, Somewhere along the way, I just got fascinated with the building blocks of music, the language of music, and creating music. And I think from there, it's sort of, um, you know, the next step is, okay, how do I disseminate my music? How do I publish music? And then you realize, okay, well, there's a lot of artists in the same boat, musicians, composers, they need help. Uh, can, I, can I speak their language and also help them translate to music business? And then that became something that was, you know, uh, desired and so I became marketable in that respect that I could kind of speak musical speak and and speak the business and then from there I just kind of followed the opportunities you know but in general uh, it was just a kind of a love for music that turned into playing and writing um, and uh, and then from there speaking the language of, of, of musicians and, and trying to help them convey their their vision outside 
it's interesting you brought up because you're you know you're traveling and your parents were scientists and all of this and i think because one thing we did have in common too is we both studied music i have a music degree you studied music but i think that that's um actually i'm teaching when quarantine my neighbor kid violin and because he's really good in math and so i think there's that element of understanding the science and the you know overtones and understanding music from a, a, a musician's point of view as well as a a marketing person. Um, I remember talking to one of our old artists, a um, certain group in Sticks, and um, they were talking about, like, why isn't our record working at rock radio? And I said, because it's in 6-8. It's a freaking waltz, Dennis. It's not going to work. I was going to say was that just, was Dennis, for sure. Of course it was Dennis. <laughs> but it was just like trying to understand. And, I, and like another situation was a Sting record that I worked because it was with Clapton. The music was Clapton and the singing was Sting. And, and yeah, 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 yeah. And so these radio guys were saying, well, it's not going to work. Sting doesn't research. And I said, Clapton wrote it. It's 12 bar blues. It's, you know, it's traditional. And Sting, I said, guarantee you it will work. And it did research through the roof. And I said, because Sting is obviously eclectic in his musical structure. But, um, but with the Clapton, writing the bed it was totally worked so mm -hmm. i think that's a really interesting asset that not a lot of people on the business side do have have backgrounds in both i find hmm. you know yeah i think maybe it was more prevalent um in the maybe 60s and 70s in the music yeah. business you know you'd have musicians start labels and um you know obviously motown and i mean barry gordy was a songwriter and uh, uh herb albert where we worked A&M. Um, yeah. So maybe recently it hasn't been as popular, but I think at the beginning of the record business or sort of in the middle, early early dates, uh, it wasn't that, that strange. Yeah. Um, it, it's definitely helped me, but I say that I do it a certain way. You know, I'm, we, at Cherry Tree, we like to work with musicians, you know, people that are like practiced and rehearsed and, and have chops and can be nimble and can take advantage of opportunities because they are musical and they are nimble. Right. So it might be different. I might be attracted to different kind of artists. If if I weren't a musician, I don't know. But it certainly feels like it's helped me a lot. Right. So why don't we just start with Cherry Tree? Because obviously we can go back and I kind of do want to go through some of your serpentining. But mm -hmm. you, you started Cherry Tree, I think, in 2004. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely Around right. Then. The published date is 2005, because I always thought it looked okay. cooler since Levi. You know, Levi's, I think, is 1895. Five looked cool. Oh, right. But, yeah, it was sort of the tail end of, of 2004. But our first album ever was April 2005, Feist, Let It Die. So technically, we, we say we were founded in 2005, but you're right. Okay, because that's when the, the conversations or whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, obviously, you, I met you at a and And so we went through how many mergers? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, yeah. yeah, so... <laughs> You managed to transition into Interscope. Um, yeah. Right. So, and I got hired and pumped out into New York. So what happened during that transition with your, your time at, because you did international at A&M. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Were you doing anything before that or was it, because I don't, I don't know you before that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was a musician. I was playing out in, in Los Angeles. I, I also got a job in the mailroom Polygram, which, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was. Um, I learned a lot, and then that led me to a job at Warner Brothers, um, and I got to work really probably in one of the best record labels ever under Mo Austin and Lenny Warnerker yeah. and some incredible artists. This was like 1989-91, uh, and 91 is when I went to work for a and Records, right. uh, and I stayed there. You know, we were working together then until until it was folded into Interscope, Geffen, and A&M after Seagram's bought uh, yeah, Polygram. Yeah. Right. From Phillips, which would have been at the end of 98, 99. So I went to work at Interscope right around then 99, which again, I, I caught a pretty amazing uh, part of Interscope's history. Um, and at first I, I was running their international department. I started in 98, 99. And, um, you know, that, that kind of coincided with Limp Bizkit, you know, some of these, some of these things might, might, sound anachronistic to you guys or, or, or whatever, but they ruled the world at one point. So I'll, I'll name you some people that ruled the world. <laughs> I mean, we worked on Brian Adams together, massive, 14 million records sold, right? Uh, twice. Yep. Uh, there was Sting, of course, there was Extreme, there were Jim Blossoms, but going in Interscope, it was 
Um, uh, Maya, the Rugrats soundtrack uh, would have been, uh, what else is big, Tupac, um, Limp Bizkit, um, uh, Dr. Dre, you know, then came M Eminem, you know, right around 99, 2000, and then um, Black Eyed Peas, and I got to work with a lot of amazing artists. And, uh, and then I started my label Cherry Tree in 2005 inside of Interscope. I was an Interscope employee and I started my own imprint. And that's where the Feist quote of the, where she talks about that you were basically a, a mom and pop store in a, in a department well, it's store. It's a funny story. It's in that special that I, that I shared with you. But, uh, you know, Cherry Tree was just an idea. I was a guy working at Interscope. I was an A&R guy by then. I, I was running international and doing A&R. I'd signed uh, a couple of pretty successful projects. I, I signed a group from Russia called Tattoo. We ended up selling five million records, and I, I wrote a bunch of that stuff and, and uh, with Trevor Horn and, and some other great writers, and um, and that was a big success. And then I signed a band called Keen from the UK mm -hmm. that I did as a joint venture with Island UK, and that had gone on to sell a bunch of records. I think it did another five million. So um, I had I had some momentum inside the company side of Interscope and Universal, but I just started Cherry Tree with nobody on the roster. It was just a, it was a concept. So I was in uh, Rotterdam, Holland, seeing her play and just saying whatever I could say to get her to sign a Cherry Tree. But what was Cherry Tree? It was really a figment of my imagination. So yeah. I just was saying what my philosophy was. You know, it's going to be about musicians and I want to respect your vision and I want to make you, because know, she was amazing. She was a master play live. I heard her music. She'd come from broken social scene. She played on stage with Peaches. I mean, she was eclectic, interesting, poetic, everything. Feist is you know, one of a kind. So I was saying all this stuff and she kind of cut me off and said, you know, I was trying to convince her to sign and she kind of cut me off. And she said, okay, let me get this straight. So you're a mom and pop shop inside a department store. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, do you like that? She said, yes. I said, okay, then that's what we are. So yeah. it's one of the things that I kind of said to get her to sign, but then it became our mantra because it really was yeah. a great way to articulate what, what we wanted to be. Yeah. And I think it's that kind of that opportunity to have that, infrastructure in place but the freedom to do what you want you know well yeah we were lucky we we're in a, we we're in a good space i i think i had enough leverage because of the successes i had uh as an interscope staff member and then starting a new label you know we, we kind of traded on that momentum um but then we had to show and prove as well you know we had to sign acts that were that were going to resonate and that were going to make the company money yeah yeah so after that, so you kind of started off and, and like Feist for me also was one of the first like legendary iTunes, I mean, uh, you know, Apple sponsorship songs. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, to me, Feist was, I call her the, like the Patti Smith of, of the, that generation mm -hmm. because she was like a poet. She was artistic. She was creative. Uh, she had uh, conviction. Mm -hmm. And yet here she did this commercial. Uh, so it was also this difference of, transitioning into licensing because i've got to throw this we do cover a lot of sync a lot of copyright and mechanicals and all of this but it was that's perfect a feist, that's a feist plaque right there, there that's there what that go. album you're talking about yeah it's yep. still up there there you go um so i think that those those things can come together when they make sense you know here's somebody with conviction and all that but it was a, a huge sync this whole ability to kind of brand and it branded her as well as the as Apple in a way that yeah. was a win-win. Were you involved in that whole? Yeah, sure. I mean, thing? Feist was yeah. our, our first artist on Cherry Tree. And, and what a lot of people don't remember is that Feist had put out that album, Let It Die, and sold 86,000 copies. And the song that was taken for the Apple commercial to advertise their nano product was a song called 1234 that was on her follow-up mm -hmm. album, this one, The Reminder. So, yeah. and we'd already sold 200,000 of that one. So we were doing uh, what we typically do at Cherry Tree, which is a, a sort of progressive, incremental job of breaking an artist, you know, really leaving DNA, doing it step by step. And she'd already garnered 200,000 sales on that album. So, you know, Apple got involved because they saw, it was actually the ad agency, got involved because they saw her trajectory. And so they're like, we want to be a discovery. We want to be connoted with discovery. And so we want to get with somebody who's about to break, not somebody who's huge. So that was great for us. And that's actually worked in our favorite cherry tree a lot we've probably yeah. done more apple ads than than most people just even major labels or indie labels um but what was interesting about feist is back then she would have never considered doing something like that but uh, a few months before and people don't remember this we um had the opportunity to sync a song of hers called my moon my man for a verizon chocolate phone 
commercial and it was called chocolate phone because I think of the hue of the phone oh, um, <laughs> but, but it had an interesting capability it could play mp3s oh, and okay. so at first she was like I'm not doing any ads I'm not doing syncs and you know I don't want to do that as you said she's got she's got tons of conviction and she's all about her music and I said I remember saying this and, and you know you were just talking before the class how you you threw us a baby shower right Heather and me we yeah. my, my wife worked at A&M but, but Beth as well and me um and my son, Andrew, that same son, I think it was around 10 at the time. I think he's a senior at Penn, but he, he was around 10 or nine, I can't remember. And I said to Feist, to Leslie, I said, hey, you know, would you do a commercial for, um, for a Walkman or for, for you know, uh, for an iPod? And she said, well, yeah, that's for playing music. And I said, well, you know, my son has a Verizon phone and he listens to MP3s on the phone. That's how he listens to music. My son's nine, he doesn't know about Walkman. Mm -hmm. And yeah. she's like, oh. I go, so it's a device for playing music. The ad's about promoting music being played on this phone. Would you reconsider? And she said, well, now that you're making that analogy, yeah. you know, I remember being nine and listening to my tape deck. That makes sense. Let's do it. So she did the Verizon phone commercial. It was great. Um, it, was, it was like with a strawberry and chocolate, whatever. It was cool. And that was a few months before um, we started talking with um, the ad agency for Apple about one, two, three, four. And so... You know, we'd already broached the subject with Feist and she'd already seen, okay, there's, there's some um, meeting ground here uh, about promoting music through these devices. But yeah, she definitely considered it for a long, long time. One of the things that was um, a selling point though, again, people won't remember this, but up until then, Apple had used a silhouette motif in all their ads, right. you know, and, and they would reshoot those. Eminem had done one, U2 had done one. They would get the band in a room in front of a green screen and then they would turn their performances into silhouettes. That was their, their uh, theme. This was the first time they were gonna use an actual video created by the artist, right? Mm -hmm. And we shot a video for Feist, one, two, three, four, without knowing it was ever gonna be used in a commercial just to convey the, you know, the, the feel of the song, like a music video. And it was a one take and it was a dance choreography and she was wearing this colorful, uh, this colorful jumpsuit and everybody, it was great. And so that agency came to us and said, look, we wanna use your video. We want to show that the nano can actually play videos because up until then these devices had just played songs now right. you were gonna be able to watch i mean again it all sounds so antiquated now but uh because now you can do anything on your phone right but back then this was the first device that you could watch a video it was small and it was portable and i said to leslie they're going to use our video the video you made the video that without, filters, without anything and that's the yeah. spot to be 30 seconds of your video it's just going to be inserted into the screen of a nano right and she's like well i like that because that's again, that, well, because it's not just yeah. her, it's her vision, you know? It's her. And so yeah. she allowed it to happen. But then of course, you know, it was hard for her because uh, it became huge. You know, we sold yeah. almost a million, million albums. She got nominated for four Grammys, uh, but everybody just wanted to hear that song. And of course all her cool friends from Broken Social Scene were like, hey, you sold out. So it, it was, it was mm -hmm. hard for her. And then yeah. the, the album after that, she did a creative kind of backlash and she made a very intimate, you know, um, introspective album. So it did affect her life, but then, you know, I still talk to her and, and now with the perspective, um, she, she knows that it was a great platform for her music. She knows that it opened up doors to things that led to, you know, ticket sales and basically having a relationship with her core fans for 15 years, which she's had. But I right. think in the end, that's a testament to her artistry and her amazing creativity. When we were talking about streaming in general and how the difference between like, I still love the album, the concept of what an album is. Mm -hmm. It's not, not, a, not a mode of how it's presented, but and I think that's one thing with streaming and digital downloads that really hurt that creative vision that an artist like Feist or that can have. And, but I think it's now cr coming up around again because we are creating things differently. And, but I, but I, I did think artists like that really it was hard because it went from a, an album format to a track format. And I think that that was, you know, here's this one singer who got known for one song. Yeah. And she's so much more than that. Well, we used to have those conversations with Soundgarden, remember? Mm -hmm. They were always like, oh, Black Hole Sun. But, you know, they knew that that opened up. I mean, you might have never it opened heard of July if you didn't hear Black Hole Sun, you know, so. Right, right. Um, now, I, I think the album question is interesting because I feel like there are artists who set out to make albums, which, you know, have a phrase across a group of songs, a song cycle, right. if you will. And those are albums that feel like full works and you can enjoy right. them from beginning to start. Then there's artists who just do singles. And I think 
hell, there's artists who just do good verses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you might be, so it depends on the intent. If you set out yeah. to do an album with a trajectory, with a with a with a you know a phrase, um, it's going to be consumed that way. And if and if you just do a single, that's just as hard, by the way, to do a great single with a great yeah. journey through three and a half minutes. Um, so I don't know. I I think it all depends on the intent of the artist. You know. And I think it's also like right now, it can be as simple as you know you might have one song that's 30 minutes you know it, it, the vision is really what you want now and it's how you can do that where before you couldn't it was an album format that was it well because you had, you had to, a certain number was, of minutes right to yeah, put in the, yeah 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 exactly yeah so that's the, totally different so so feist kind of started you into this um i wanted to talk a little bit about flipside because i think flipside was a really interesting project early yes. on too um <laughs> what you know, because you had that, you had Tokyo Hotel um, and Robin, you know, you have this mishmash of such different yeah. artists, you know, and what, I mean, how did you find them? What was the, what was the underlying kind of well, thing that brought I you into these early? Moving around the world. Yeah. So I was never, yeah. um, I, it was very easy for me to move around. Plus I was also running international marketing. So anything that came out on Interscope, Geffen a and you know, was my responsibility to market outside the U.S. So I had to take a lot of trips with different artists, whether it be No Doubt or Dr. Dre or whatever, D12, you know, and I was always out there. So um, when you're out there, when you're living and breathing music, when you're in clubs and you're in meetings, when you're, you know, in studios, uh, you, or even just the bus stop, you know, with people that, yeah. that live there locally, you, you're going to get exposed to, you know, cultural movements and music and uh, musicians, producers, et cetera. And I would just find these things. And I really was just looking for good. You know, one of the reasons I named the label Cherry Tree is because I didn't want it to connote any kind of genre. Cherry Tree, I thought, was mm -hmm. genre agnostic. It just sounded like an organic, I mean, yes, it's a direct translation of my last name, as you said, but I thought it, it was fitting because it just, it just felt kind of fresh and, and, and new and, and organic. I like that, you know, and so I would just look for good. And so mm -hmm. the thing that all, the, all those bands have in common that you mentioned is they had something innovative, they had good songs, they have, usually they have a real point of view and, and a great lead vocal proposition, you know, a mm -hmm. vocalist, like, like Tokyo Hotel. I mean, Bill was just arresting, you know, he would, he yeah. looked like a, like a human manga character. Like when you walk mm -hmm. into a room, like you're almost like how, and just the, the, the kind of um, energy it took to present himself that way, you know, such commitment. Yeah. Uh, that, and then he'd sing, you know, a song like Monsoon. It was just like, okay, this is, this is amazing. And then his twin brother, who completely presented differently than him, you know, visually was right next to him playing guitar. Great. And you're sort of comparing and contrasting these same faces, but the personalities are different. I mean, the whole thing was just so robust and interesting. And um, I guess that's what drove me. I was always looking for something. I still do something innovative with a point of view, with a great voice, um, great songs. And it's a lot harder to find than you think. <laughs> no, <laughs> because, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because, because, uh, it, that's what cuts through over the time it takes to break an artist. So if you, if you have all those things, you have a real um, compelling proposition, it will power you through the time and effort it takes to break an act, which is, as you know, is not overnight. Right. So I would, that was kind of, it was, it's kind of where I was drawn uh, you know, in terms of my musical taste because I'd lived all over, but also it's a good business model. Mm -hmm. because because you find something creative it, it's usually counterculture it's coming from a subculture you can amplify something that's very real and authentic as it grows it leaves dna with 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 people and communities and um it, it sticks and so i i'm really proud that a lot of our artists on cherry tree not only have been very successful but they maintain a very successful career and a livelihood mm -hmm. because of their music and that makes me proud as a musician as the brother of a professional musician you know it's that was an important thing mm -hmm. Is there anybody in your repertoire, and I don't mean necessarily a label, but this just brings it, is there someone that you can listen to over and over and over and never get bored with? Yeah, I mean, this is gonna sound like a commercial, but Sting. Sting is the yeah. first person that comes to mind when you describe somebody like that. Yeah. I mean, constantly, his compass is music. So he's not doing something because he feels he should or because somebody else is doing it. He really, and he, sometimes he'll go out on a crazy limb He's following a musical impulse and it is just, it is fascinating to watch. It's incredibly satisfying to help even a, in a small way. Uh, and not only that, it's, it's, it's uh, edifying. It, it informs our philosophy. And I think it's a big part of why other 
musical, innovative artists have been attracted to the Cherry Tree environment. I think I learned a lot of it from being around Sting at, at a very young, yeah. early age. Yeah. I remember my uh, my cello instructor who played with the LA Phil, we, we would go to Sting concerts and count, this is how geeky we are, we count time signature changes. Because yeah. we're like, yeah. what the hell? <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, but you know with Sting, it's amazing. Yeah. Because he'll, he'll, he'll employ the use of an odd time signature, but you might not be able to tell right away because it's such a no. well-written pop song. It's yeah. got an incredible melody or whatever it is, there's a motivic thing that happens. Like, um, it's funny because um, a lot of musicians love Ten Sunders Tales because it's got seven days on it. Right. That's another right. time signature. It's amazing. We still play it live. He, he does it live with the band. It's so good, but it's such a beautiful kind of a, it's a love song ultimately, you know, self-deprecating kind of a love song, but it's in, I think it's in five, right? So yeah. he's, he's uh he's still he's sort of coming at you at, di at different light and different altitudes yeah you know? that's why yeah. it's so easy to listen to his music over and over and over you discover something new every time it's really mm -hmm. fun yeah i had to work with uh with stewart this last year when i was at a label and that was fun kind of just the whole i think and now i've worked with every copeland so yeah, yeah I think it was fun yeah except maybe their dad yeah, no, no, I worked with Ian, <laughs> Ian he who shall not be named, uh, uh, <laughs> name. uh, Stuart, obviously, and, uh, yeah. Miles had a lot of success. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. I worked with Miles for a long time. No, yeah, Miles cracked me up. Miles, uh, just so you know, is, was the manager at one point, and he's pretty legendary, he's infamous, um, and he is rather, rather outspoken. There's a zillion uh, Miles. We got to work space. with a few outspoken managers like that. We're, yes, we're yes, lucky. Good. We're lucky. Yeah. Bruce Allen. Yeah. Bruce Allen's another Bruce? one. He's got a lot of opinions, but we'll fight to the end yeah. for his artist. You know. Yeah. When I worked with uh, Melissa Etheridge with um, Bill Leopold, and I knew him from back in the day, anyways. And he was this guy's a yeller, screams at everybody, and he would scream so loud I just start laughing. I mean, and it would piss him off even more because I just started mm -hmm. laughing at him. He, would you stop yeah. laughing at me? And, it was pretty funny. Can't, can't um, really do the yelling anymore in the music business. No, not really. I'm happy to hear that the yelling is kind of antiquated. It's definitely down. That's a yeah. good thing. Extinct. So I know every, you know, you signed a couple small acts. Um, I don't know. There's a certain singer out there behind you on the wall um, that you kind of did some stuff with. There's a few. You know? Yeah, uh, um, I know that these guys probably are, would love to hear about your Gaga. And I definitely want to talk about because one thing that you could do, I think, really, um, and this, I think, probably comes from your A&M and Warner experience, is this level of artist development. Mm. And I don't think you see it the same way that what you can do and what you've done. Um, and I think it's because you and I grew up in that environment. There was a concept of an artist development. And I think, you know, you did this with Gaga. You did this with, uh, with Tokyo Hotel. I mean, there's some people that you have a really interesting approach, and I'd kind of love to hear kind of the story yeah. um, of how that rolled out. I mean, you know, people talk about artist development. It really stems from the artist. You know, it's, it's about giving the artist the support, the resources, um, the right advice at the right time, and the, and the, the space to, to develop themselves. You know, true, talented, great artists will really drive the artist development. You know, the rest of us, we have to just make it comfortable and safe and um, and uh, you know, make resources accessible for them to do that. So at the beginning, it's about identifying the person, you know, the artist, the group, whatever, that's going to be able to achieve that kind of trajectory. And then it's about really just helping them. However, um, I still think there's a ton of artist development that happens. It either happens with the artist by themselves, you know, uh, in a room with their with their phone or the camera or their instrument or it happens with a small team in management you know it might happen with their agents if they're developing a, a live show and how to perform to people and, and grow a live audience so I mean, artist development is is key it's key to the longevity of an artist it's key to consistent communication with an audience over a period of time you know sting the thing about sting perfect example he has a dialogue with his audience and he's had it for years he's had it for 35 years and they grow with him they come to the shows, they follow him on his musical journeys. It's a beautiful beer round. Um, now he's immensely talented and hardworking and he really devotes himself to communicating musically and otherwise live, et cetera, touring tons with his audience. And that's the kind of commitment it takes. Um, 
But I think artist development is probably the most enjoyable part of this whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. sure, marketing's fun. Making records is a lot of fun. Uh, writing music's great. But, but helping an artist achieve, fulfill what they want is, is really, really rewarding. Uh, it's, it's definitely a service job, you know, and um, you're constantly thinking about how they can realize what they're trying to achieve. And, but, but when you start hitting these sort of benchmarks, it's really, really fun and you can celebrate yeah. together. I think you were talking about Lady Gaga earlier, you know, amazing uh, experience. Um, I met her. She, she had an incredible uh, early sort of story. She, she had been on a label and had gotten dropped and it, and her A&R person who signed her originally was great. Uh, 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 Josh Rubin actually was mm -hmm. fired. And so without a champion in the building, they dropped her and she was kind of floating. She was working with a producer who was partners with a, uh, a, a label executive who signed her and brought her uh, to in a kind of a joint venture to Interscope. And uh, I think Jolene Cherry was in the mix there too. She had a, a deal with Universal. And then um, I was introduced to her and she really was probably, you know, cause Gaga was always Gaga. She's incredibly talented. She was driven, she knew what she wanted, but she probably had gone through some of the toughest times in her life being dropped from the label, you know, having achieved sort of this dream um, and, uh, but she really just wanted to make music and work and write. And so that's how we connected. We started writing together and we were a song called the fame, you know, literally in my garage where I kept the studio at the time. And, um, and she's like, Oh, I'm going to name my album this. And I have a whole concept and it's the fan. I thought, wow, concept, this is good. And, and, uh, she just was special, you know? And mm -hmm. so we ended up writing a few more songs and then she invited me to a and the record with Vince who had brought her in. Um, and then we did a, a collaboration with it ended up being Streamline Vince's imprint, Cherry Tree, Con Live, Acon, because he got involved when he was writing with her uh, on Just Dance, and uh, and also he had been working with Red One. Red One had been working with her, so a lot of that um, was was kind of a group effort that really helped her kind of build confidence. She went on tour with the New Kids on the Block, which was a, mm -hmm. a reunited project that I was A and Ring. So we, she would do an opening set and then she would play at night in clubs after the show. Um, but it was a lot of fun. You know, I worked with her for a couple albums. They came out on Cherry Tree. We sold millions and millions of records. And, uh, and I think also we pushed, you know, creative boundaries uh, right. at radio, both, you know, in sound, tempo, songwriting. Um, so it, it, was, it was a really, really great period for us. Yeah. I think uh, to me, artist development, it's, it's an interesting... Um, balancing act. I think part of it is you're, like I always tell these guys, if you come into a pro, uh, as a marketing person, if you come to a label and you don't know what you are, someone like me will tell you who you are. And I think that in artist development, it's trying to, without necessarily pushing your opinion or whatever, to, help, to nurture and foster, mm -hmm. to give them that voice, you know, to help direct them without directing them. You know what I mean? How do you how do you think, or yeah. do you agree or disagree, or how do you no, balance? It, listen, I can only speak to our experience, and maybe we're okay. lazier, Cherry Tree, because I do a lot more a and so. work. Well, what happens is I look for that extraordinarily original artist. Yeah. So, so that's what. So, so the A and R process is the most scrutinized of Cherry Tree. We need to find some, and we say no to a lot of things, and they might be great, and some some go off and yeah. do great. Um, but, but I'm looking for something extraordinary. And so when you have that, the artist development process certainly comes from that artist. And that's what I look for. So that's what yeah. I mean by being lazier. When you've got that locomotive in an artist and they're very rare and yes, we end up not signing that many things and we say no to a lot of things. And so, so that's the part that's, that's difficult to sustain while you're, you're sort of searching for that very uh, unique artist. But um, if you have that, that becomes the compass, the, the locomotion, the, and then you amplify. Then the, then the artist development is amplified. And that's what I mean by being a little lazier. I, we don't prescribe to our artists. If, if, if you're an artist who doesn't know yet what your proposition is, we're probably not gonna be gravitating towards you. you know, right. That's not what I like to do. I like to amplify uh, very authentic, genuine subcultures, real, real things that are happening, movements, cultural movements. I think that's one of the reasons why when we hit, it's beyond a hit single. We've had many instances where we just don't have a hit single. We have a cultural phenomenon. 
-hmm. you know, we, we put out LMFAO, they had Party Rock Anthem. I think everybody can agree that was more than a song. I mean, it is, yeah. you know, I was talking to the, 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 the uh, gentleman who works at Spotify in Canada today, and he said, hey, by the way, that's still the biggest, the most downloaded song in the history of the Canadian record business, Party Rock Anthem, LMFAO, on Cherry Tree. But I think it was more than that. There were people shuffling, there were people wearing zebra pants, you know. Mm -hmm. it was, we did a, a huge successful Cherry Tree tour where they headlined and Far East Movement was on the bill. And so I think it, it's culturally um, more uh, resonating when you have an artist that's driving the artist development. Again, I, there aren't that many, and I don't need to be smug about the role that people play in advising artists. It's just, I'm always looking for the genesis of, of, the, of the aesthetic and the vibe to come from the artist. I think that's what resonates right. the truest. Right. Oh, I totally, I would agree. I mean, I think that finding you know, like when I get demos or we get tapes or anything, people say, oh, okay, we listen to it. It's, it's good. I'm like, well, it, it should be. I mean, that's, that's the base. That, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, I'm not going to even waste my time if it's not good. Don't tell me that. But, um, but yeah. I think it is. Like I was talking to a certain person who's on this call. Uh, we were talking about an old artist of ours at A&M that we both agree uh, actually wasn't that good of a singer, but it was a good writer. But I think she was, she, and I think you'll probably figure it out, was more of a stylist than mm -hmm. a good singer, per se. Mm -hmm. She's very successful, huge. Uh, but I think it was also one of, I'll just say it, because it was Cheryl, right? And Cheryl, when, because of those... But Cheryl, but Cheryl... Cheryl Crow. She has an incredible voice. I think she's a great stylist. We'll that might be the first this. disagreement we're having on this call. Okay, because I think, I think she's got a... I think she's got oh. a thin voice. I know. I'm, really? This is me. I think her, well, I, I do. think her intonation's incredible. I think yes, she's recognized the she sings. But one of the things people don't realize about Cheryl Crow, and we were both lucky we got to work with her because she's she's one of those originals. She's an incredible producer. She no, get totally. For that. Man, she is totally. an amazing producer in the studio. Yeah, I know. I happen to love her voice. But I think the best God. thing. No, I think the best thing that happened to her was tanking her record. <laughs> the first one. The, the one that didn't yeah, come out. Yeah. It was. It was. <laughs> boring and i think that sometimes those things you know as devastating as they might appear mm -hmm. are these things that will actually change and give you your yeah. voice and well it yielded tuesday night music club so totally, in, in totally. The end, you're, 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 yeah you're right yeah and i think that's what created i love her vision. voice though i just absolutely love cheryl's voice I I, it's, no, it's not like i don't hate it but i think that it's it's funny voice. you said her though because i happen to think her voice is there's something not in her tone, but in her articulation, it's Karen Carpenter, like who's one of my most favorite. Absolutely. Ever. Oh yeah, I'm not um, gonna debate that either just there. Since she's so meticulous with the pitch. I love that. I love her intonation. Well, she it's will, accurate. it's always right, and she goes into it. It's like. And she's got that raspy she, she thing melts she can tap it. into too. I don't know, I, I really, I think she's, I think she's been. Oh, I, I'm not saying I don't like her, but it's like. Well, you may like, have heard her in me. the old days before I did, so I don't know. Yes, you know, maybe she yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also like I could listen to Patty Griffin. Amazing. Every day. Another amazing vocalist. Yeah. To me, I was listening to Patty Griffin last week. Yeah. 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 Um, but she's a great writer. Great writer. Um, yeah. And a great stylist in that way of, of coining a song. And yeah. so that's what, I, that's what I mean. It's like you don't have to be, you know, I listen to Cheryl all the time. It's mm -hmm. not like something that. But as far as when you're looking for a, a, a talent or you're looking No, no, it has to be an original yeah. voice. It has to be an original voice. Exactly. It be it's an original voice. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. It yeah. has to resonate yeah. with other people, you know? Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a whole thing. That's why making records is so fun because a record is a, is a capturing a moment, you know? It doesn't necessarily have to be perfect, but it, it, but it has to convey an emotion. And, um, yeah. and when you get that right, man, it's such a good feeling. I think that makes you unique and you, you touched on this is your because of your ability of being bumped all over the world um, this exposure um, because um, just having different artists that possibly wouldn't be you know introduced in our culture or anything you know you have this ability to kind of bounce around and as you said hear different kinds of music I think that um, um, uh, who was it that I'm brain farting on it was when, um, oh my God, what is it? I'm totally brain farting. One of the cherry tree acts? Um, no, with LMF, the, um, oh my God. L, when, uh, Far East Movement. Right, uh, right. So, you know, having different 
genre bending, culturally bending mm -hmm. artists. And I think that's a lot because of you, you're ping ponging all over the world and experience yeah. with that. Yeah. Because okay. you, you, you hear and with the internet and different ways that we're cross culturally blending our, mm -hmm. our music and our, our, our sounds. I think that that's something that you can see that. And that's a gift I think that you've been given from yeah. all of that exposure. Maybe because of my musical background, you know, playing piano, piano lessons and music theory and things like that, I wasn't as, as uh, daunted by that. And then also just yeah. sort of being, being across borders. It's more that I wasn't thwarted. It's more that that didn't, that didn't become a filter for me. Like, that's weird. That's not right. weird. I, 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 so in other words, once you get past that filter, then you just look for good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then if you see good, you grab onto it as hard as you can and you, and you try to help. Far East Movement was, it's an incredible story because they are, they're LA kids. They grew up in LA, yeah. they're Asian Americans, but they're, I don't know, I, I'm first generation American. They're probably third, fourth, you know, I don't know. Right. I think pro, pro is probably first generation Korean, but but Kev is third or fourth generation, you know, um, I think Japanese, um, Chinese American. Um, but they were completely cultivating the subculture. You know, they would take me to these festivals that they were throwing, you know, with all these Asian American kids and they were all, pogoing and dancing and moving and 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 then they were making this music which was like a hybrid of of electro music and hip-hop but their hip-hop mm -hmm. knowledge was incredible it was impeccable they could quote yeah. verses from biggie all the you know rakim what it, it was they were just uh extraordinary and and also their live performance right? i went to see them at this club in la called tattoo and they just it was like they lit up the club and everybody mm -hmm. went crazy um they had this thing you know where they did the the uh figure eight thing as MCs where they were rapping with each other right. and, then they, and then Kev pulls out two mics and he's got a boat coat around one. It was extraordinary. So it was pretty easy to see that, that they stood out, you know, and then they had a song called girls on the dance floor that was starting to get airplay at power 106. So there you go. Proof of concept. Yeah. And, and it wasn't long before they started really, really honing with the help of these incredible producers named stereotypes who have gone on to, you know, win Grammys and, and, um, and produced for Bruno Mars and everybody. Uh, yeah. Still very close to all of them. They created this sound, which was the Far East Movement sound, which, which, you know, the stereotypes didn't produce like a G6, but the the, uh, the cataracts did. But like a G6 was really kind of, you know, exemplified that amalgam of of electro and hip hop. And it's still mm -hmm. you throw you throw that out in any party, any club, still, you know, fills the dance floor. So again, another cultural yeah. cultural thing. It was a cultural movement that song. It was still being used, still being covered. Yeah. Um, but but it was amazing. Like I, I love. Yeah. I'd like to no, be I was going to say it was, it was interesting to see them fight a lot of stereotypes. Not, yeah. Not the, yeah. It was just stereotypes, but they, they had a lot. They were at the forefront of fighting preconceived notions Cultural. about Asian faces mm -hmm. doing pop music, or, which which was to me, I never really understood that because Kev is just a superstar. I don't I don't yeah. see Asian. Or, I just saw this guy light up a room. Still, by the way, now he's managing other artists and he's. He's a Renaissance person, you know. He's he's really uh, he's extraordinarily talented, but they just had a star power. They had aura. It didn't matter if they were green, blue, came from this place or that place, and uh, and sure enough, you know that's that's what happened. It, mm -hmm. The music just blew through any stereotypes or any kind of prejudice, and it, they had they had the first ever number one record, and I'm proud that this is on Cherry Tree, by the way, of any Asian American ever in the history of the record business. It not only went to number one, it stayed at number one two weeks. It fell to number two the third week, and it went back up to number one the fourth, which also never happened. Yeah. So it's a it, that's a especially there's you don't see it back here, but I have a big mm -hmm. Far East Movement plaque right here on the left. Yeah, and that's what I think. Uh, you know, uh, I do a part in my class called Coffee and Donuts. You guys are all like going whatever they're rolling their eyes, but uh, my professor when I was in school stress the importance that music is the people that document we're the anthropologists we're the people that mm -hmm. create the voice of the generations and you know how powerful change can actually happen through the arts and what we're seeing right now is just mind-blowing um you know creatively uh therapeutically everything that's going on right now is you know the arts you know music and yeah. vision and creativity. So uh, yeah. I have a student yeah. that had a question. Jonathan, do you want to unmute and pipe in? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Jonathan. Wow. Hi. Oh, He's you're in, really uh, there and that's not a virtual he is. background. That looks amazing. He's in St. Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am there, but it's, I, it's not where I actually am. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
but um, my question was pretty, it's pretty a pretty general question, but um, I mean, as you were saying with these movements that with some of the artists that you, you've worked with, um, like for Party Rock Anthem and how like it changed the scope of like music generally um, for that period, um, sometime, so there was this whole electronic dance music phase, um, then more recently, um, Latin music is a lot more popular now. Um, and I just wanted to get your opinion on what, other than, than the factors where it's like people like you who introduce these artists or give these artists the opportunity to, to express themselves. But what do you think are other factors that contribute to like these movements that um, more or less take over the world? Because I mean, a lot of these, these music styles have existed long before, but there are, there are definitely these distinct periods throughout time where like, oh, this is the, the, the thing now. Yeah, I know. That's that's one of the hardest questions to answer, you know, trends. And I, I don't really use trends as our uh, A&R antenna. It, it, there certainly are trends, you're right. And there's certain things that become popular. And, but I really, the search is about finding talented people within those genres or, or, or outside those genres or breaking those genres. I, I really just look for talented musicians. And of course, if there's a bunch of talented people congregated in the community, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna get a certain abundance of, of, of maybe that genre or, or that beat or whatever you wanna call it. But I, I'm usually looking for originals and, and people that are really talented. Uh, and those people can harness whatever their surroundings are, whether they be musical, cultural, whatever, and create something really special that can resonate around the world. So. I'm probably not the guy to ask about why trends happen. I look for individuals that push the creative envelope in music. Um, that will yield some trends, as you said, right? But I think it's usually there's a locomotive behind that. And it's usually uh, somebody or, or a group of people creating really compelling art. You know, I don't know why it happens, why a vortex opens in, you know, in, uh, in uh, San Juan or in, or in uh, Vienna or whatever at times. I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know that I travel everywhere I can to find great music, you know, and sometimes you're right. Like Beth and I used to work uh, with Soundgarden at A&M when okay. Seattle just seemed to be just bubbling up every kind of incredible band, you know, Mud Honey and, and Alice Chains. And it was, it was an amazing time. I don't know why those things congregated there. I mean, I'm sure there's other people who can speak to that. I just know Soundgarden was amazing, you know, and I was, I really relished my time working with them and being in the studio with them, watching them work with Brendan O'Brien. You're right, there was something in the zeitgeist there, but um, for me, I was focused on how original Soundgarden was, how great the songs were, how great Chris Cornell's voice was, how the detuning that Kim Thale did, you know. Uh, I don't know, I don't know the answer, you're right. Something happens and, and, and then sort of things create a, a community, but I'm always looking for the auteur of that. I'm not yeah. really trying to determine a trend or, you know, a lot of people ask me going, oh, you know, is it gonna be female singers? Is it gonna be male singers? I don't know, it's gonna be whoever's good. You know, if you, and by the way, that philosophy, and, and we're 15 years old now, Cherry Tree, 2020, has yielded a pretty balanced roster, you know, of, of types of music, of male, females. It's funny, I never went out looking for a certain thing or a certain trend or a certain voice. Uh, I just went for good and it ended up, if you look at the, if you zoom out and look at the last 15 years, it's a pretty broad and varied roster. So I think maybe I'm just gonna keep doing that, just looking for something for good. Great. I have a question from somebody whose mic isn't working. Um, uh, and this will be a big one, I'm sure. Uh, so what creative advice would you give upcoming artists during this time, pandemic lockdown? Uh, yeah. So will, the broaching of this time in general, um, is yeah. fascinating. Um, it's interesting because I always feel like uh, no one could have predicted this, obviously, or whatever. You know what I mean? In, in the in the broad scope of things. Um, but Cherry Tree, we've always been, at least for the last six, seven years, been working remotely, mobile, from the road, from venues. Uh, we have we have studios set up. We have portable studios. Um, we we'll probably. You know, it's, it's, it's not as alien to us to be working like this right now. Um, we, we do a lot of conference calling. We communicate asynchronously uh, around the world, different time zones. Um, we, we create music, you know, uh, we collaborate a lot over the internet, email, um, we exchange virtual sessions, et cetera. So we're probably um, 
not that disrupted. Um, now, obviously, you know, I say that respecting all the suffering people are going through and, and how difficult it is. And, and obviously people are, are, you know, protecting their health and so there's, there's more important things. But in terms of our workflow, it hasn't changed that much. And um, I think it's because we've been so um, uh, determined to take advantage on behalf of our artists, the technological innovations that enable them to create their music, publish their music and magnify their music. So all that to say that my advice would be <laughs> the same advice I would have given a kid 30 years ago, woodshed, practice your skills. Like, you know, I was just saying this to one of my artists. It's like, you gotta do it when no one's watching. You gotta do your scales. You gotta do your arpeggios. You gotta work on your songwriting craft. You've gotta learn, uh, you know, logic or Ableton, do it. And I think this is a, a great time to really, really focus on your skills that I can almost guarantee you're gonna pay off. There's gonna be an opportunity that arises after this is past or even while it's happening where those newfound skills you've cultivated are going to be able to be uh, deployed and, and it's gonna help you. So, so to me, learn, uh, add skills to your arsenal um, and, and work on your presentation, work on your skills, do it while people aren't looking. <laughs> yeah, there's always an opportunity to publish, but, but get really good. That's, that would be my advice. That's great. Um, I was once at a, uh, having dinner with Bill Rieflin, the drummer from, um, who just passed, unfortunately. Um, but we were talking about practicing and he said, he goes, yeah, he was the drummer for REM and ministry. And, and he goes, yeah, I hit a really a wall where I was just not learning you know and he goes i wasn't playing good and he goes and i went back and i was went back to one i went back and was practicing paradiddles and i was practicing the practice of practicing you know that whole element because you know you do this all day in day out as a musician but sometimes we don't practice we play you know so there's different kinds of things i think all the time that you can be growing on you know um and don't be afraid to just try stuff you know that's my my stuff. I just am always said like what I ask them to do each week is look around at stuff that you're seeing that's new out there, because people's brains are growing exponentially right now, because of scarcity. We're stuck. We're cloistered. We're stuck inside, um, and I think that ability to it has to we're like basketballs that pop their seams. We have to come out. The energy has to come out. So, do it. Um, okay, I've got so much I can bring up. Um, does anybody else have a question? Well, there's a, hey, Tatum, yeah, do you have a question? Hi, um, I'm Tatum. I was, I, I was wondering, um, so have you ever had any disagreements or issues with your artists um, or even with um, people that you work with? And how do you resolve that, especially since um, I'm sure, um, I'm sure that artists, as they evolve and they grow and they um, gain popularity, um, their perspectives on things change and their attitudes change. Um, so how do you um, uh, deal with that while also maintaining your relationships and um, looking out for their best interests? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yes, plenty of arguments, disagreements with, uh, with artists and sure people that I work with, um, but the important thing is, and I remember Jerry Moss, who is the M of A&M, who started A&M with Herb Albert, the A of A&M. He said to me once, he said, um, the artist has one career. You're, you're working with a lot of artists when you're at the record label. You, you're dealing with a lot of careers. The artist has one. And it should be the ultimate choice of the artist, what they want to do, because they have that one career. Now, you have the right to argue with them. Uh, you have the right to propose your your your, your argument and, and support it. You could even argue till you get blue in the face. You can you can you know be passionate, but in the end, they have to decide. And I really live by that because uh, it really struck me when he said this to me. He said it to me many years ago. He said they have the one career; they have to live with the decision they make. So it could be something like, "What song do I perform on Good Morning America?" It could be like, "I don't want to wear that in the video," or "I don't want to put that out as a as a single." So you know. I basically try to share my experience and my opinion with the artist. Um, I can be 
I can try to be persuasive, you know, when I feel really strongly about it. But in the end, it's their decision. Now, here's the part of that, that that's hard for some people. You have to be prepared to live with that. You have to be prepared to work really hard for a long time, sometimes years, get an artist to a certain situation, and be prepared for them to make a decision that you don't think is right, that might hurt them. Maybe it does. And you just got to deal with that. Because in the end, they should have that call. Um, and I'm fine with that. I like it. I can sleep at night. I can, you know, I'm happy that I brought every kind of opportunity I could to someone. They made the final decision. Sometimes it works. You know, if you've done a good job finding the right artist, they ain't hiring properly and signing the right artist. Sometimes a dis crazy decision is going to really pay off. Um, so in the end, you just have to trust that artist. If you believe in them enough to sign them and invest in them and support them and try to amplify their vision, you've got to believe in them having the ultimate decision. So to answer your question, we have, you know, adult conversations. We each propose our, our arguments and then the artists decide. That's how it works. A cherry tree anyway, which I think was created at A&M originally. Yeah, yeah. It's hard, but you're right. You're totally right. Um, I completely agree. Um, Hannah, you had a question? Yeah, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, hi, Hannah. So you were talking about artist development earlier and how important that is. And I was, and like, obviously you've created, cult, like you've cultivated cultural icons that we all grew up with, like Lady Gaga, LMFAO. So how do you foster their, um, their voice and their vision without like putting your own thing on, own spin on it? Right. And, yeah. So, so we call that um, amplifying without distortion, right? Like, like if you were an amplifier in a stereo system or whatever, we, we call that uh, gr growing the, the reach of their music without distorting their vision. And um, that's one of our main goals at Cherry Tree. So we really work hard on that. We, we really were vi very vigilant. We make sure that we are conveying as transparently as possible the original vision of the artist. And, um, you know, I, th I think that if you're committed to that, you make decisions accordingly. So you don't want to compromise anybody's vision. You know, you, you want to have the opportunity to discuss it. Like my previous example with Feist and the, and the, and the chocolate phone. Um, and, and she's very bright and smart and listened to our point of view and decided, okay, uh, the way it's presented, I can see how it doesn't compromise my core beliefs. Um, and there are some d discussions I had with her, for instance, where she'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, um, uh, I remember the way in which she chose to perform one, two, three, four on the Grammys wasn't how I would have liked to present it. This was a long time ago. She did it with a bunch of brass and it was cool. And my friend Jason Fries actually played on there and her, his dad. Um, but it's not how I would have done it. I would have, I wanted her to do a, a kind of a, an upbeat version, the version that, of the record everybody knew, maybe even do, do the choreography from the video that everybody would seen at the Nano. Come on. She said no. And I said, okay. So we did it the way she wanted and it still was great. You know, I don't know, maybe it was better like that. Maybe she was right, but I felt fine. I felt great. I felt like I brought the best ideas I could to Feist. We helped her get to the Grammy. She got four nominations and then she made the decision. And that made me very happy. She deserves that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, that's kind of the approach. Um, and a question from Amanda. Hi, um, my name is Amanda. Uh, I was just wondering, since you've worked with so many incredible artists, um, if there was anyone that you haven't worked or collaborated with that you always wanted to? That's a nice question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've gotten a chance to work with a lot of incredible artists. I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I guess if I did, I mean, let me think. Uh, I always thought Tegan and Sarah are really cool. I always wanted to work with them. Um, oh, also, right. like, I don't know if I could get a time machine or I could do it now, but I'd love to work with ABBA. I just think they're, you know, their music's amazing. The songwriting's amazing. Um, I did that one. See? So I'll I want to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, it's tough because, you know, it's hard to sort of think about who you'd want to work with and you've had such a like luxury of working with such, like, I mean, Sting was my hero growing up, you know? Yeah. So and I manage him now. It's amazing. And, and every exchange I have with him is, is fun and, and I learn something. So I don't know. I feel like I would, I was, be, I'd be greedy if I said I want to work with some, some more, but yeah, I mean, those are some of the artists I've always thought about. Like Tegan Sayre is cool. ABBA, um, maybe going back in time, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix. I don't know. It's just something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any artists that um, kind of going to what you said earlier um, about 
you know, conflict or whatever. But like for me, there's one artist that I worked with at AM that I think was just this, it was just like so seamless and just a perfect blueprint was uh, Johnny Lang. And because it was just such an easy, uh, there wasn't, it was just clear, you know, this, the, the talent was there, the imaging, the idea, um, everything about it was just so simple. It was like there was this divine roadmap. Um, I would say, is there anybody that's been like that? And also the opposite <laughs> of like, because I think some of these roadblocks, the other ways are ones that have been, I've learned so much from um, artists that have presented me roadblocks, roadblocks that have challenged and changed my creative uh, kind of approach. Yeah, what have I you learned from? I, I think about it differently. I think about the relationship that we have with our artists, whether we manage them or we issue their records as a record label or we publish them because we have a publishing arm as well. It's about that relationship. It's like a marriage, right? Are you compatible? Are you each contributing? Are you each playing your roles? Can you come together and talk about issues and problems when they arise? Can you overcome hurdles together? It's a, it's a brain trust, you know? And there are some artists that we are compatible with that we've been able to be very successful. There's some artists that we compatible, but we didn't succeed even though we tried everything. And there's some artists that we're not compatible with and we try not to sign those, you know, and they could be amazing. They're just maybe not gonna benefit from our skill set, or, or, or our flow is different or our rhythm's different. Um, so I, I think hurdles, they arise when, I mean, hurdles are gonna come in every project. So I can't think of one that was really easy or one that was super hard. Unfortunately, they, they all seem pretty hard to me. But <laughs> when you're trying to bring something innovative yeah. to the market, there's gonna be resistance. It's almost part of the equation. I always say to my artists, you know, if it's not hard, then you don't have an original proposition. So, so that's, and by the way, that's, that's a little bit of an encouragement to get through the, through the hurdles and difficulty of, of what it is to introduce new music and, 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 and new artists. But um, I think if, if you've got a healthy collaborative relationship, you, and, and obviously a great proposition, talent, great music, mm -hmm. you know, work ethic, you're, you're going to get there. You're going to get there to some extent, right? Because, you know, Johnny Lang has been successful, you know, more successful than some, less successful than others. It all yep. depends how you measure it. But, but he's got a career making music. And my band that I managed, The Last Bandoleros, opened for him maybe, I think, eight months ago or something. So he's right. still got yeah. a very viable career with a, with a chorus. By the way, always very kind to me uh, back in the day when he was, we worked with him when he was 15. Now he's, now he's a grown man, but uh, very talented. And you're right. He, he had a very, um, it, was, it was very obvious. You know, he, was a, he was committed to the blues great guitar player, great voice. I mean, he, he, he had his proposition pretty honed at an yeah. early age, yeah. um, which, is, which is wonderful. I think that's maybe why you're characterizing it as sort of falling yeah. into place so quickly because he, he, he had it together though. You see yeah. what I mean? It's like he totally. knew who he was, he knew what he was presenting. There was a core fan base that kept congregating, it kept spreading. It's like my band, The Last Bandoleros right now. You know, they're making very, very original music. They're from San Antonio, they make Tex-Mex, country pop music right nobody else is doing that but man they can sing harmonies they can play any instrument they write great songs other musicians love them you know they've been taken on tour from everybody by the the, the mavericks and sting and dwight yoakam and it's going to happen eventually it's just going to take a little longer because they don't fit in any niche but they just put out an album you know uh they've got a facebook show they do every week called around and neon cactus that now has been picked up by by facebook to be promoted because they're seeing real traction real audience so I think if you have a good relationship, I guess this is what it comes down to. Any artist can take a long time to break. Do you have the kind of relationship with that artist, whether you're their manager or their label or their agent or, or, or whatever, their lawyer, that is going to weather the difficulty during that period? And if you have something very strong, you know, that's why I say it's like a marriage, you can not only weather it, but you can, you can harness it and, and you can succeed ultimately and you can enjoy the process. Totally. So I've got a couple of questions. One thing I wanted to bring up, because you, what you've just brought up was simply, uh, Kafaro, uh, our old president, he brought up a quote, uh, which I think is similar, but in a different way. He goes, uh, hopefully we can uh, work with artists that we make money with. Hopefully we can make work with artists that are, are great to work with, and preferably both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, I always that, remember, that, I always it's something boss. like that. Yeah. I was our own boss, and he said something to me, back in the AM days that I always still remember, he said, uh, have fun, 
And if yeah. you're having fun, money will come. <laughs> yeah. It's contagious. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a great mantra because it's true. You know, if, if you're enjoying something, then you're, you're exuding it. And then people are attracted to that. And you know, that gets monetized and, right. and then people want to share and they want to share it themselves and they become change agents and they grow your fan base. And I'm seeing it happen with glass bandoleros right now. You know, everybody's tuning into around neon cactus and then they're going and sending 10 emails going, you got to watch this next week. Right. And so I, I see the growth exponentially and, and you're able to monetize that by, you know, we just put out an album, we're selling special packages mm -hmm. to fans and, and people are buying them. So it's, they can, we can have fun, they can make great music and they can make a living making yeah. music. And, and I think also the, the clearer you have the vision, the telephone game of translating that vision is so much easier. So if you have an artist that yeah. knows what they are, I can be the evangelical person that's going to talk about it and I can talk about it in that voice to the radio person or the Spotify person who's going to try and translate that. If the vision isn't clear, it, it's like playing telephone. It gets confused yeah. and lost. So the I mean, I like to use words like, like point of view and message yeah. because, because vision, I use the word vision too, but I mean, Whatever. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's hard for people to understand the concept of, do you, you're an artist, do you know who you are? Yeah, me. What do you mean? I, yeah, this is how I grew yeah. up. I play music. I sing. And they're right. But there has to be a message, a point of view, a specific um, intent. And I think that not because it doesn't have to be to make music. You can sit in your basement and try all sorts of different genres and do whatever. It's great. But I think if you want to communicate um, succinctly and cut through, at least in the beginning, when you're the beginning of your career, because I think later when you've built your fans, Especially, mm -hmm. this thing's a great example. Is you can do whatever he wants. They, they trust you and they will yeah. follow you. And, and he, yeah. he does definitely stretch. It's great. But at the beginning, um, you need to cut through. You need to stand out. And a succinct, direct message helps. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a couple questions. Um, Anna, do you want to pop in? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Anna. And so I have a question regarding your time with international marketing. I know that you also spent a lot of time moving different places when you were younger. I was wondering if one, you think that really gave you a leg up and more of an understanding of other places. But then I was also wondering if there's any advice you would give someone that specifically wants to go into that international marketing area. Yeah, good questions, thank you. Um, it ended up giving me a big leg up because um, my time starting and then to now uh, has, has coincided with the interjoining of not only the music business, but the world, right? Because of the internet, right? Uh, because of technology and because of travel, you know, the, the, the uh, well, again, before all this, but the ease of travel. So I had these experiences. I wasn't uh, deterred by borders. I had friends around the world. I'd grown up listening to music in different languages. I knew maybe that certain things resonated with human ears despite cultures or languages, you know, so I was able to kind of compare and contrast. Uh, maybe I wasn't doing that consciously, but in my ear or my head. So yeah, it gave me a big leg up, but also just the world becoming interconnected, streaming services becoming global. Um, now having experience in all these different markets, having um, relationships on these different markets became a real asset. So yes, definitely. Um, not only that, it's, it's made life so fulfilling. You know, I, I, can, uh, I can enjoy, cultural things, you know, like today we went um, platinum with a song that's a collaboration with Sting and an artist, a French artist named Gims, right? Uh, it's a song called Rest. It's a beautiful song that they did together. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise. I don't think people would have expected those two to collaborate, but something wonderful came out of it and, and it's worked. You know, people like it. They're listening to it. We've gone platinum. So um, I'm able to enjoy those things, you know, because I've spent a lot of time in France and we met Gims and Nice and it's not, um, it's, it's part of the flow of cherry tree. And so all of a sudden this new opportunity flowers, you know, I've gotten a chance to produce Milan Farmer, who's, you know, one of the most amazing artists. And if you guys don't know, check her out. She, she sings mostly in French. So a lot of people don't know her outside of France and, and, uh, and Quebec and well, she's big in Russia too, but, um, she's amazing. She's like a mix between, uh, Marilyn Manson and Madonna, but, but, but different and, and cool. And, uh, I got to write and produce a whole album with her. Um, and I don't think if I didn't know of her music, if I hadn't traveled through France and, and been really, uh, you know, uh, indoctrinated into her aesthetic and her music, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And then she invited me. It was a huge honor. And so it's really enriched my life. Uh, in terms of getting an international, um, you know, 
it was great for me. I love it. Uh, I learned so many of, of the key concepts in the record business from working in international. One of the things about working in the international area, especially at a record label, is that you become almost a mini label on your own, that department, because you've got to deal with uh, sometimes special versions of the music, you know, sometimes a special artwork, uh, different time zones, different seasons, different timetables for a record release. So you you end up forging pretty close relationships with the artists and the management to create these tailored uh, uh, product, piece of product. So, so I got to sort of learn about every part of the record label working at International, whereas if I think I would have worked in a a domestic area, I might have been just limited to that area. Like if I'd worked in publicity, okay, I'd learned a lot about publicity, but I worked in international on publicity. So you had to interface with the marketing and the touring and the, um, you know, production. So uh, I guess if you want advice about getting into international, I mean, obviously what helped me, believe it or not, was um, at the time there was this technology telexing before emailing and you had to type fast. And because my boss at Warner liked to dictate because he wasn't a great typist. So, um, and I could stay late. He liked that I stayed late and he could, so I ended up with the head of the department, just him dictating all these things to all the heads of all these different countries. So I was able to glean information through that because I could type fast. The other thing is languages. Languages really help, you know? Anything that can help you um, understand better what someone's experiencing locally so that you can market the music to reach them better is an asset, you know? So I, I'm in fire running an inter international department today. And, and when I did, I look for these kind of candidates. You know, I, I hired people that had language skills. I hired people that um, were uh, had had experience living in different places. You know, um, you know, my my product managers. I think when I stopped running Interscope International, Tomoko was from Japan, but did lived in America as well. Don hired from Toronto. Uh, Jurgen, who now runs the department, uh, had uh -huh. was German, but served as product manager at Universal in Austria. So. Those are the things you could you could um, you could get into to to make yourself marketable if you want to get an international, especially in the record business. Yeah, um, got a question from Wally. My answers are really long, guys. I'm sorry. That's okay. They're you great. guys all have couches. I might be putting you to sleep. I don't know. No. <laughs> Hey, Wally. I, I'm Wally. Hey, Wally. Yeah. Um, oh, so, yeah. Wally. I saw you earlier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so. Um, I uh, am just looking for a little advice. I've been interested in artist management for at least since I've been in high school, and I've been out of high school between a gap year and this first year uh, for about two years. So I've been interested in artist management for a while. And I was wondering, you know, being somebody who's also uh, interested in the creative process as well as a talent search, like I'll go through the new releases of R&B and hip hop, like project by project, just to see what sounds good and uh, what's kind of coming around as a trend, as you said before. And I'm wondering, I hear more and more about A&R from you and um, the other work that you and your label has done. And I'm kind of wondering how I could possibly get around to blending management with sort of A&R and other things like that, just because I, it interests me, like, in totality. Mm -hmm. a good, good question. I mean, for us, the way we do management, it's very A&R and management are inextricably tied. So I think A&R is kind of the lifeblood of all the music business, like the artist and the repertoire, A&R. I mean, it really starts and ends there. Um, if you get that right, the rest of the job becomes so much easier. Uh, that's the part that we spent the most time in. The scrutiny we put into that area is is the highest at Cherry Tree. And so I can't even separate management from A&R, you know, because the, when, when an artist calls you and goes, hey, I just wrote this song, will you listen to it? Do you think it's my single? You better have some A&R skills, you know, so you can comment and say, well, this could change here, or, you know, um, and that comes with experience. And I think what you're doing is fantastic, listening to projects that are currently successful, maybe some that aren't and kind of trying to glean information as to why or how. Um, but how you combine it is, is like this. You, you want, you're doing management, you want to, you want to do A&R too. Um, find an artist that you really believe in, right? That, that you're going to be able to collaborate with, as we said earlier, someone that's, that's going to appreciate your contributions and get to work and try to help them, try to help them and, 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 and use whatever A&R skills you have hone them by doing what you're doing, research, but also get some on the field experience. Mm -hmm. And an artist that 
maybe can't continue to work with after a few months or, or, or maybe whatever you try doesn't work with, or, or they may not like you or whatever it is, but, but get some experience and, and, or maybe you get lucky and you, you know, you're, you're scooter and you find Bieber. I don't know. Uh, okay. But you got to get in the game and play. You know, uh, that's one of the beautiful things about the music business is yes, it helps to uh, have education and be able to write and, and, and communicate uh, lots of other skills. You know, if you're, if you're good at math, that can definitely help. Um, but you can also get experience from jump and, and, and kind of start to absorb and learn and adapt and grow. Um, so I, I definitely would pick something or somebody or a song or something you really believe in and, and offer your services, try to get involved and, and see how it goes. You know, Absolutely. And you learn from there. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I, when I was in Seattle, I was managing a huge band called Bark in the Dark. You've never heard of them. And my friend Susan Silver was managing Soundgarden. And it doesn't matter. It's like I got so much chops from because we worked together. I mean, we were both the only two female managers in the city. It doesn't matter if they were successful or not. I learned so much by doing that. You know, I was the, the tour manager, the manager, I was the lighting director. So you, you do everything. So mm -hmm. jump in and learn. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Joe, Tom, you have a question. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. All right. Hi, I'm Joe. Um, I just wanted to hear more about your experience um, as a songwriter, because I feel like when you're writing, like oftentimes a song that you think has like the most compelling melody or lyric, like not isn't necessarily the one that becomes like the most commercially successful. So um, I was just wondering, like, um, if you've had much experience with this, or is this something that you consider when you write songs, um, and how you balance those two perspectives? Yeah, good question. I love songwriting. It's probably where I'm the most happiest when if I'm not hanging out with my family or. Um, I, I love helping artists. That's probably the, the happiest. But the songwriting um, is just there's a feeling I can't describe. I've been doing it since I was very young. Um, and it's it's very rewarding. Um, I, I think I enjoy it more than producing because producing is this torturous um, process of trying to achieve what you hear in your head in the real world, right? Through sound waves. Uh, where songwriting, you know, song just lives uh, despite of its recording, you know, it can be in sheet music or it could be whistled or whatever. It's, it's a beautiful thing and, and, and to channel kind of inspiration and, and then uh, be able to be part of turning it into a, a living, breathing song that people enjoy is, is, is remarkable. It's like one of my favorite things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's different um, than uh, running a label or managing or being in a meeting or doing a Zoom class. It, it's a whole different thing. And you have to kind of shut off the rest of the world, at least for a certain amount of time, and not check your phone and, um, and really tap into an emotion or a story or something you want to convey, and then try your best to, to uh, communicate that through, through music, through lyric, through, through melody, through harmony. Um, it's, it's kind of a ritual. Uh, it, luckily, it's something I've been doing uh, for a long time, way before I was even in the business, I was songwriting. It's kind of what um, attracted me to the music business was was writing songs and, and wanting to know how I get them out there and how I share them with people. Um, but it's it's definitely a discipline, you know, and there's people who do it uh, many more hours a week than I do now, um, who are in the middle of it, who, who just uh, live and breathe and probably have all sorts of great techniques. I mean, my technique is... Um, it's really about um, sh shutting out the rest of the world so that I can tap into whatever the feeling I'm trying to convey is. And sometimes it's, it, it's, it's a very clear path. Sometimes you're feeling, you know, very emotional, whatever it is. And you're kind of like, oh, I know exactly how I'm feeling. And it just comes out. Um, and sometimes it's harder, you know, like when you're under deadline. I need the song for this. Uh oh. Um, but different people have different techniques. I, I'd say mine is to really, really dedicate myself during that period of time to the songwriting process and not think about what's going to make this big or what's going to, you know, does that verse too long or whatever. When you're writing a song is try as true as possible to um, channel the emotion or the story or both that you want to convey. Then after that, when you're recording it, producing it, presenting it, you can do some edits, you can change the intro, you can do whatever, that's a whole different function. But writing the song, it's almost a spiritual thing. 
you know, for me, it's very spiritual. So it's, it's hard to talk in tangible terms about that. But what helps me uh, in songwriting is to vote, devote myself to just writing the song and, and, and as uh, accurately as possible, registering the feeling. So I don't bring commercial considerations into it. Now, I must do it subconsciously, right? Because I know, oh, that was a hit. Way. So in the back of my head, I must be going, well, this song can't be 14 minutes long. But I really try to get those voices out when I'm writing the song. Mm -hmm. I try not to have them interject. I don't know if that helps. That's great. One thing I wanted to kind of go on that, because you've done some really fascinating collaborations. And I'm a huge fan of collaborations. Um, because I think as a writer, and they push different uh, comfort zones uh, yeah. in your writing. Yeah, so collaboration like I, anything is great, I oh, think. Totally. Yeah. But I think, it, is there any surprising collaboration? I mean, the Shaggy one to me just made complete sense. I mean, that, it was like a big duh. But is there anything that, like like the one you just said with Sting and the artist Geems. from France, which Geems, yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with. Yeah. So anything yeah. that's been a surprise or um, something so that worked <laughs> unexpectedly? You just were like, they're great. Yeah, I, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm a, I stir stuff up. That I'm kind of an instigator when it comes to that stuff. So they're not, it's not as surprising to me. I'm constantly trying to push the envelope. I'm, I'm constantly trying to bring uh, creative people from different areas together to see what will happen. I, I really think that's the key to innovation, mm -hmm. you know, is to just erase those genre lines or, or erase the box that you're in and just try to push beyond it. And sometimes it's a wild, crazy miss. <laughs> you know? yeah. sometimes, sometimes I'll try something people are like, what is that? Um, but, but sometimes it really connects, you know, you mentioned Sting and Shaggy. For me, it seemed really kind of like obvious. I know everybody says no. it's crazy, but, but they both come from a reggae tradition. They're both yeah. wonderful people. They're both great songwriters. They're both, um, good humans. They like to share. They like to, uh, um, you know, uh, share their music. They like to collaborate. I don't know. It didn't seem that crazy to me. And, uh, the only thing that was crazy is the reaction from people. They were like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, you all need to see yeah. the crazier stuff because this is not that crazy. They both would agree. come yeah. from reggae, you know, um, and they made a wonderful reggae album and it was, a, it was really satisfying. They got, they got recognized as such. It, got, it won the Grammy for the best reggae album of the year. And those guys deserve that. You know, yeah. they deserved it for that album, but they also deserved it for all of the, Shaggy always says it, you know, Sting helped reggae music get more into the mainstream, which opened the doors for people like me. And I'm grateful for that. And I, I just think that's also a testament to, to Shaggy's approach. You know, he's a very generous, generous individual. And, and so Sting, and I just knew that would work, you know? Yeah. And, but I didn't know how it was gonna happen, right? I mean, I didn't know it was gonna end up with two microphones next to each other, scatting, you know? And, and, and all of a sudden, like, one would stop singing, the other one would start like they'd rehearsed before. It was really weird and organic and, and, and magical. Uh, and I think, I think we caught some of that in the album. And I think that's why yeah. it resonated. Yeah. And I think going into trends, like like you look at somebody like Trombone Shorty or, you know, mm -hmm. these these kind Jackie of things. Jackie just where performed you, with, by the way, Jazz Fest. Oh, uh, yeah. I know. He's amazing. So, you know, like uh, Jim, the guy I'm working with, he's got a jazz trumpeter who's working, did a project with an R&B singer. You know, yeah. it's like music is one language. It's just a different voice. And I think that that's a, it's so, I a love. Good quote. That, that's a good Thank t-shirt. There you go. <laughs> Good t-shirt. So um, one other question I had, and then I want to talk about Sting a bit, just because I think he's brilliant and I'm so happy you're working with him. I couldn't see a better fit. Uh, one question, uh, this is an interesting question. Do you prefer to sign, and I, I think I might know this, sign an artist with or without a manager or does it matter? Um, I, we talked about collaboration. I love collaborating. So yeah. from a very early, um, time with cherry tree we were always looking to win as a team so you know when people were going crazy for the 360 model right we were developing our offerings we were becoming a music company that offered help with management with record label with publishing with production with writing but we weren't trying to grab all that right so i just to me that was always counterintuitive because we would be the only ones in the room <laughs> and when we ran out of ideas or we hit a stumbling block there'd be nobody there to help so when we were managing an artist we always tried to make sure that they were on a different label, you know, and, and when they weren't, you know, a very, very uh, special occasions, it was usually like a, a joint event. Like we had an artist named Natalia Kills that we managed, but she was on Cherry Tree. She was also on Will I Am. So Will I Am kept it, you know, uh, 
in context. It, it helped us if we got stuck. And um, so I like the idea of collaborating with different people. I like the idea of having a great manager involved with an artist that's on the label. I like the idea of having a fantastic publisher that contributes ideas and help. Um, if I see someone that's really talented, if I, I am lucky enough to come across somebody, I'm lucky enough to recognize it, will it stop me from signing them because they don't have a manager? No, no. Uh, and, and by the way, we may go, okay, we're the ones to manage you. Let's find you another label. That's what we're doing with Alexander Stewart right now. We manage Alexander Stewart. We've been putting out his songs, but we are actively looking for a label partner for him. I don't want to remain the label for him. Uh, I just feel like he could do better um, uh, in, in the next chapter of his career if we had a partner. So I actually, I know some people don't like this philosophy, but I like sharing the, uh, the success and, and the profits. And I, I think it's more fun. You know, it's like being at a craps table when everybody's winning because you're rolling. It's, it's right. pretty fun, you know, rather than just winning by yourself. Um, and also, I think you can achieve bigger things when you collaborate. And so the pot is bigger. So your share may be bigger right. than if you just kept it all yourself. You know, you can, you can sign everybody to everything and then, and then be stuck and, or, or the artist will resent you because, you, you know, when they look at the big pot, you're making more than they are. That that's, that's, doesn't feel right to me. It never did. Maybe that's because I'm a musician, you know what I mean? And I used to play in clubs and I, and I know what it feels like on that side. And, um, but no, I, I think, I think that if an artist now, maybe this is where your question was going. If an artist has a bad manager, they can definitely destroy the project. Yes. That's for sure. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Have I yeah. not signed an artist because of a manager? Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's the reason why we started managing. I was just yeah. so just, I was pulling my hair and I was like, we got to be able to do better than most of these guys. Like, I care, you know, ladies, whatever with the, the managers we were dealing with. But, um, but there's some fantastic managers too. Who are absolutely an asset, and um, but but you can say that about an agent. You can say that about a, a record label person. You can say that about a, anybody. You could say yeah. there's good and there's bad ones, you know. But can can a bad person in a core team uh, hurt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that abs there's strength in that diversity, and you never know who's going to come up with that good idea. It might 100%. be the the intern that happened to say something. And I love that you were, the example you said with doing dictation, you know, you never know what you're going to learn doing a crap job, but by being around yes. it and hearing, observing. We were, we were in Burbank at Warner. He was dictating mm -hmm. um, telexes to me. I was typing, but there was another part of that job. I had to answer the phone from his wife and I had to lie to her that he was on his way. But really, he just wanted to work more. So I'd be like, oh, he's on his way. Well, Martin, it doesn't take that long to get to Westlake. I'm like, oh, I don't know. He left me. And she, he'd be like, I don't know. My, my car broke down. I'm like, yeah. oh. But, you know, it gave me an opportunity to stay late with the boss and hear everything he was writing to, to all the heads yeah. of the different affiliates. Yeah. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes because I think Sting is just such a brilliant um, case study to talk about in general. Um, he's in my top three. Um, as far as artists and musician and just an all around just fun guy. I mean, the stories we've had with him. Um, but can you just um, kind of talk about your experience with Sting and, and what he's doing? And because he's doing always doing so much. I mean, I saw him on Fallon, which cracked me up. That was brilliant. Um, and I'd also I know you're doing the residency coming up and, you know, yeah. you might have to reinvent that. So yeah um, um so. the most the most wonderful artist to work with staying um because he's he's so he has so many talents so you know he can tap into any of those at any time he can play guitar he can play you know bass he can play keyboards he can write songs he can act he can sing it's it's just remarkable but beyond that he's a really great human being you know considerate um generous collaborative thoughtful um i'm always learning from him you know, um, he's, he's, he's fearless. So he'll do something that looks, you know, really counterintuitive at first, like I'm going to make a lewd album and yes. he'll turn it into something, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that sold a million records. I, I don't know. And he does it over and over. So it's funny when you said case study, he's a great case study, except he's a terrible case study because when they made him, they broke the mold. So I don't know how you replicate yeah, a career. Like, thing, no matter if you, if you were to do the same things he did, I don't think you'd be able to, because I really think this guy is, He's one of the most extraordinary artists to ever do it. I think, again, I'm his manager, so you may think I'm biased, but I do believe we're gonna be listening to his music, we, the collective mm -hmm. we, 
in 100 years, 200 years. I mean, it, the, the, the repertoire is that remarkable. You know, when you, when you consider that uh, the most performed song in the entire BMI catalog of 14 and a half million songs is Every Breath You Take, right? And that's just one of the songs he wrote with that kind of resonance. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. So um, it's an absolute honor working with Sting uh, for all those reasons. And, uh, and then, then there's this work ethic, you know, which, which makes every day uh, fun and um, eventful um, and, uh, and new. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, you know, I guess that's the definition of an icon in that somebody that can do this and reinvent and and he doesn't uh, he's not a fearful man he's like this i'm going to make this music and it's art and like seriously the loot album on paper at any record company would have been like are you crazy it's like it's why don't you do that man it's the, i know it's, the, it's, it's like the winter record it's a, it's a reggae winter, record yeah. with shaggy i mean it's, yeah. it's every day yeah. it's a duet yeah. with games with just one platinum and friends i mean it's, by the way, he just sang uh, background vocals on the new single by All Saints, which yeah. is a cover of Message in a Bottle, which is a pop reggae version of it. It's so good. It's so good. It, right. it was premiered on the BBC uh, last Friday. It's so good. And he just, yeah. he heard it and he's like, this is great. Let's sing on it. <laughs> That's it. I mean, he yeah. really, his compass is musical. He doesn't think, yeah. what am I going to look like? What else is everybody doing? He's just like, man, this sounds good. Let's do it. It's yeah. amazing to be around. Well, and I think Last Ship is interesting. I mean, I'm working on Sumner's Tales and some of the stuff, it's like, you know, that, that was a, a really, there's a couple of albums that he did that were very introspective, you know, mm. and I think were hard for him to do mm. uh, emotionally, but he doesn't shy away from those. And um, so what, what yeah. was the Last Ship? What was his inspiration for that? So, you know, it's, it's a, a soul, because yeah. you, you, that was a great question. You soul Cage. softball. Yeah. Yeah, The Soul Cages, which is probably one of my favorite albums of his. Maybe my favorite album. Um, yeah. Came out in 91. It's the first album I worked with him on. Uh, I was his international publicist at the time. Beautiful songs like Mad About You and All This Time, a bunch of others. Um, but it was written around the time um, that, you know, he, he was losing his parents. And uh, he was processing that and processing um, his upbringing in the north of England in Newcastle. And I think... Um, album touched on a lot of themes that then he further developed in his play, The Last Ship is Musical, um, in which he's been starring and acting. And it's been a real uh, labor of love for him. He, he just, he loves it. It's, it's, the music's beautiful. Um, we have presented it in uh, all over the UK, in Canada, at the prestigious Princess of Wales Theater there for six weeks so last year. And then this year at the Amundsen in LA and uh, in San Francisco. Uh, until it was, you know, closed the theater because of the, the corona situation. Um, but it's being presented in other places, it's been presented by other, by other uh, casts. Um, it's, it's really a beautiful work, which, as you said, kind of started from some of the inspiration. In fact, it includes some music from, from uh, Soul Cages. But it's, it's a really, really comprehensive work. It's beautiful. And I think it taps, it harnesses a lot of his skills. It's, it's, he's a lyricist. He's only, he's the book writer, really, because he didn't write the book, but he's, but really he leads the book with the music um, and the motifs and how they reoccur. And it's, it's really an immersive work. It's great. It's great right. to be around and be part of. Well, I think also, you know, as a person, you know, um, it was I brought up earlier, the, the power of what music is, but it's also, you know, his rainforest charity, all of this stuff that he's done, he's definitely, uh, puts his, you know, he, he mm -hmm. stands up for what he believes in. And yeah, I think a, there's different ways to do that as a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what you look for in an artist, that conviction, that, that, yeah. And it, and it can rare. manifest in different ways. So. <laughs> Sting has, Sting has, a, has it all. And it's really, yeah. rare to find. yeah, it really is. That, that's why as a case study, I'm not sure. Yeah. I it, don't know. If it's applicable, but, um, but he's definitely someone to, uh, to watch and and um, you know the the, the journey is really enjoyable you know yeah. uh, you just don't know I mean he did a song with Steve Aoki you know yeah exactly Sunday. it's awesome yeah. when and Shade I don't know if there's any Steve Aoki Shade fans out there but it's a great song called Two in a Million uh, that just came out of Steve Aoki's album too so he's constantly challenging himself um, and he's a consummate musician which I find inspiring yeah he's just a great musician I'm gonna let you is there anything parting thoughts um, that you'd like to share or 
any, you know, because these kids are all going out into a huge world of uncertainty, but guess what? It's always uncertain. Um, but anything that you'd want to just say? You know, the only thing I'd say is, you know, I could give you sort of a keep your feet on the ground, keep reaching for the stars kind of advice, but I never really liked that because it wasn't very mm -hmm. tangible. Um, an interesting thing is that as I think about where we were in the music business 10 years ago and how, let's say 10 years ago, uh, and how it was um, just the worst to be in recorded music, to be a master mm -hmm. owner, but it was great to be in live. Right, because because mm -hmm. people, you know, and people were talking about using music as lost leaders. Let's give away songs to sell tickets, and and intellectual property holders were like, "What up in ours? We spend all this money to market and create it, and the masters aren't free, but people are stealing them, and you just got to give that up. You just got to just give up music so you can sell tickets, t-shirts, whatever." I remember that was the argument. It was very unsafe to be in master ownership, but it was very very safe to be in live. Look at us ten years later. Who could have predicted that it's the exact inverse? It's it's live, and, and by the way, I. I'm across both. So, you know, we're, we're getting hurt in, in one area and, and we're trying to kind of balance that so we can weather the storm. But, you know, the live business is decimated right now. And master owners are sitting there going, wow, we have all these, you know, sy systems to, to bring in income regularly from our masters through streaming and subscriptions, and we're okay. Um, so I guess my point is, it's hard when you're, you know, right in the moment. But if you zoom out, the thing to remember is that the music business is dynamic. It changes all the time. So I think there was a great question earlier about, you know, how do I get an international? Hone your skills, hone the skills that are going to be applicable no matter what the climate, you know, good writing, good communication, uh, mathematics. Um, you know, there's another gentleman that asked a question about, I'm, I'm studying every hip hop project, what's resonating? Do that, that's fantastic. You can draw conclusions from tra trajectories of projects really, really work on your craft. And then I think you'll be able to market that. You, you'll have a bit more um, security. I mean, obviously nothing's secure, but, but if you really work on your craft and you can bring something to somebody, uh, a contribution to an artist or to a company, um, there's a higher chance that there'll be a role for you. Um, so things are changing all the time. Like, you know, the way I would have marketed a record literally a year and a half ago is not the way I'd market a record right now. Mm -hmm. Not at all. I mean, I just got a conference call with one of our artists and, and a gentleman at Spotify Canada. And it's, the rules have changed literally in the last 18 months. I love that. It's super exciting. Yeah. You know, people go, oh, wow, it's changing. It's always been changing. You know, yeah. um, when I got a job at Warner Brothers, I must have been, I don't know what I was, 23 or something. I was an international publicist. The head of sales came to me, Lou Dennis. And he said to me, Kid, you missed the heyday of the record business. Welcome to Warner Brothers, right? Kind of joking, <laughs> right? And I thought, I thought, wow. But I've had a career. How long has it been? I've been in the music business since then. I've been able to, you know, support my family and and uh, I don't know. I just you just do what you love, and if you do what you love, you'll do it for many many hours. If you do it for many hours, yeah. you'll get good at it, and then someone will want to work with you. That's what I think. So it sounds like everybody have out fun. there is they're very bright. So I think yeah. they've got good yeah. prospects. Well, as our governor said, it's we aren't going to reopen, we're going to reimagine. And I think that's a great way to to look at it. And I hope everybody so, stays well and healthy. Thank you again, Beth, for having me in, in the class. Great. It's an honor. I'm going to hit this off and just stay on. And everybody else, I will see you next week. Thanks for your questions. Good luck, guys.